Groove City. Hey, what's up? I'm Lefty. And I'm Rich Furness, and welcome to Groove City. That's right. We are back again and very excited to welcome one of our very close friends living here in New York City. Give a shout out and welcome to St. Francis. Thank you, guys. Hey, everybody. It is such a like full circle moment for me being here right now because... You guys are like my DJ big brothers. Yeah. And when I met you two two years ago, ever since, it's just been like so much admiration and love for you guys. Likewise. And now my producer big brothers as well. Hey, so it's just such a full circle moment for me. Honored yeah. to be here. Honored to be even considered to be answering some of your great questions. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us, man. It's been really excited to watch, you know, the growth and everything that you've been going through and seeing you kind of progress as a DJ and now an artist releasing your first release very soon yeah, on Quincy Boy Records. Yes. <laughs> a banger. Very excited for that. Yeah, we kind of just want to hear the whole story, I guess. you originally from Pennsylvania, is that right? Yeah, Pittsburgh, proud. I am... Shout, <laughs> shout never... out Pramani Brothers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Shout out to Pramani Brothers. We put French fries on everything. I mean, if you've ever met a Pittsburgher, we are insanely proud of our heritage and it's being from Pittsburgh. It's a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The Pramani Brothers, I just want to say that they will grab your money and then put the French fries with the same hand in your sandwich. But <laughs> we love them for that. It's the grit that you get from Steel City or whatever they call it, the Steel Town? Yeah, I don't know. Steel City. Steel City. Um, All right. But interestingly, I think Pittsburgh is an interesting segue into my persona and my name as a DJ. So St. Francis actually comes from uh, my Catholic confirmation name. Mm, okay. um, St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah, St. Francis of Assisi. Who my middle name is named after Francisco. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. Spanish okay. version. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, patron saint of animals. So I like to say I'm the patron saint of these party animals that we run into <laughs> all the time here in New York. <laughs> but um, for anybody who doesn't know, Pittsburgh is a very Catholic city. Um, there's a lot of Catholic iconography everywhere. And it seems like every decommissioned Catholic cathedral becomes a bar or a brewery or a hookah bar oh, or wow. a club in Pittsburgh. Yeah, so, I've I'll, been to the Avalon, right? Yeah. That's an old church. <laughs> so yeah. um, that's kind of where St. Francis comes from. Uh, first of all, it's just, you know, my, I guess, Catholic identity was always super important to me. But then also I just grew up in these spaces. With, I, I remember there's this one super cool hookah bar in Pittsburgh called the Sphinx that's in this old church. So it was always just like partying in cathedrals when I was nice. um, up and coming. Another one of the big uh, clubs in Pittsburgh is called Hot Mass. It's also in a church. Oh, um, nice. But, um, you know, as you guys know, uh, I'm a huge fan of soulful house, gospel house. And when I started kind of coming up in the club scene in New York, um, partying in all those churches. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and when somebody, when somebody just rocks it and gives you like a Sunday service, we call it, it just took us to church. Yeah. This took us to church. So, um, I was really grateful when I came to New York and started getting into the club scene to, um, get in and experience and listen to a lot of people who I would consider just fundamental legends of the genre. Some of my first experiences clubbing in New York were listening to Ali Escobar, Todd Terry, yeah. Ted Patterson, my all-time favorite, Honey Dijon, <laughs> back when she was spinning to clubs of, you know, three, 500 people. And, you know, I remember the first time being at the club and hearing Honey spin. And I was like, do, do y'all hear this? Do y'all hear this? <laughs> what What is this music that I'm hearing? Yeah. Um, Next level. And I was like, baby, this is house music. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but it just spoke to me and it spoke to my soul. And I didn't know um, just what a fundamental impact discovering house, or as I would sometimes say, house discovering me um, would have on my life. Because it really fundamentally changed the trajectory of, I think, who I am as a person. It helped me understand myself. Um, I think house music has made me into a better person. Um, and as much as this genre has evolved and is really in this era where it's more popular than ever before, fundamentally, it will always be about unity, equality, freedom, and power. House music makes me feel free. It helps, it makes me feel powerful. And, um, I just knew from the moment I heard it, I wanted more of it. I wanted, I never wanted it to stop. Was that yeah. the set that made you decide to start DJing? Um, frankly, it's it's funny because I really got to I got to meet her recently, honey, who's like my idol, and I got to finally say like, you know, you are one one of the one of the many people who really inspired me to be a DJ. But just watching people like her and watching people like Ellie Escobar and all those people behind the decks and just their mastery yeah. of this craft, um, people who 
you know, grew up in a time where it wasn't just like you have a hit single and then you, you know, blow up into yeah. stardom. Yeah. People who have really grinded through built it. their career brick by brick. Um, and we're really around in the heyday of house music, which I consider to be New York City in the 90s. I always say that I'm kind of... Also <laughs> Chicago. Let's, yeah. let's be clear. Also <laughs> Chicago. Also <laughs> Chicago. Um, and, you know, I could talk ad nauseum about that, but I will say, I always tell people I'm nostalgic for this um, period of time that I didn't get to myself experience, which is 90s New York. And um, yeah, you guys both know, I'm, I'm also really passionate about the roots of this music, the cities where it comes from, and um, Chicago, Detroit, New York being mm -hmm. the really big, big three trifecta or trinity of um, influencing influencing house music. Yeah, I wanted to ask. So then, since you were kind of you know had the discovery here in New York City, uh -huh. what made you move to New York from Pennsylvania to begin with? Um, just just work. Um, in my day job, I am a writer and editorial director. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to tell your, yes. your and story. Now you're on the other side of the mic. <laughs> yeah. um, so just um, moving here for a job. Um, I actually, in a former life, was a TV journalist. So I was a TV oh, wow. reporter back in West Virginia where I went to school, um, which interestingly enough has really helped me as I've been becoming a producer. As I've, I think I've told both of you this. I can like, see that. Like, like I used to have to edit video. I used to have to edit sound. So the when I when I look at Ableton and I open up Ableton, laying something out on a timeline makes actually sense. makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I was um, a video editor first, yeah. you know, like <laughs> before I was like a real, real producer. So it's like, I feel like mm -hmm. those those worlds definitely cross over, you mm -hmm. know. The editing, all the crossfades, everything really translates well from video software, I think, to audio. You know? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, move to... Um, New York in 2016. And I will say it's been, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. It's been really interesting to see the club scene evolve within the past, what, eight or nine years. Um, the the 2016 to COVID club scene in New York was so different yeah. than it is uh, has been post COVID. Yeah, I think it was a reset for the club culture out here. Honestly, yeah. it, was, it was getting really tired right before the pandemic. Oh, oh yeah. Oh my gosh, I was about to say the opposite. I am like so nostalgic for that. I feel like the parties were so much more creative and like there was a freedom in my in my opinion. And yeah. maybe you guys you guys have a, another point of view. I felt like it was like there was so much more liberty to have these like really creative experimental parties and like, oh, it didn't work or we didn't get the crowd we wanted that time. We can try it again. And now the, I guess, club and promoter culture that exists in New York is yeah. it's like one and done. If you don't pack this place out, you're that's like, it. that's true. That's, true. that's definitely true. I remember, I remember I there's a lot more conglomerates <laughs> too of like, like a couple companies running a lot of the yeah. biggest, like the big parties and they've kind of not left room for a smaller. For sure. I also feel like though, right before the pandemic, I feel like people were kind of tired of mm. nightlife. You know, like it, it was kind of getting a little old, especially like the bottle service clubs and the more. The music was yeah. just very cookie cutter. You you would go to a club and I'd hear the same songs in every club. Uh -huh. Where I feel like now you have a lot more digging, you know. But I will also say before, like before the pandemic, people would stay out much later. Like you, I'd be kicking people really? out of the club at <laughs> five a.m. Versus a lot of the places I'll play now, like the rooms will wind down earlier than what they did before yeah. the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, and maybe it was just like, I was like really immersing myself in the experience of that time. But I think of places like, um, at my 26th birthday at Avant Gardner, it was $5 to get in. Yeah. <laughs> and there, it was a disco party. They had leather couches surrounding the, so you could just, leather couches, plants all around the dance floor, all these disco balls everywhere. Ellie Escobar nice. was playing. And I just remember you could like chill on a leather couch. Be, like, I remember there was another party I went to at Avant Gardner. There were cages all throughout the dance floor. So you could dance in these cages. Yeah. It's just like nice. that level of like- I it, saw that like, setup once. I yeah. missed the old AG a little bit. It yeah. definitely had a grittier, yeah. and grittier it's, vibe to it's it. It's not just that. It's like, I remember just there, there being some like really cool stuff. Like um, I remember when Mr. Sundays was in um, Industry City yeah. <laughs> back in the day. So it, like there are still so many pockets of that amazing creativity, I think in New York. Do you think because like now house music has become so popular, electronic mm -hmm. music has become so popular and there's like a couple of promoters who are really running that scene that they rest on their morals now and they don't feel like they have to be as creative because people are going to come to these shows regardless. Hmm. I feel like that's a really good question. And I think I'm not, I'm not totally sure. And if I'm not, I'm not sure if I can answer that, but I do know there are so many, obviously that's no, it's no secret to anybody. There's so many more DJs in the scene right exactly. now. There's almost been this inversion where there's more DJs and 
dancers. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. I, mean, I feel like myself, and I would maybe say the same thing for Lefty, we're DJ DJs. Like most of my crowd are other DJs and, or people who want <laughs> yeah. a DJ. So it's like, you know, and that's kind of become a lot of the smaller uh -huh. club nights are like that. It's just a lot of DJs all hanging out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like though, you know, there are a lot of newer promoters, but I feel like the people that are kind of in the game, I feel like they still really focus on the curation and making a good event because I feel like at the end of the day, you have to have that element yeah. and they know that because they've already been doing it for a long time. I think the curation in New York has been incredible the last couple of years. I do hear Rob though, where I feel like the party design, like as far as like the extra elements of like how they design yeah. the club, how they make that yeah. specific night look special is kind of hasn't been there as much. You know what I mean? Right. You'd get more of that where it'd be like the whole venue would be designed a certain way and you'd be a little bit more immersed. Like mm -hmm. I think you don't have as much of that, but you also the curation and the DJs that we're getting in New York right now are incredible. Yeah, yeah I, I would absolutely agree. And, um, you know, clubs are popping up like weeds now, yeah, nowadays. Not. So there's yeah. so many more venues. There's so many more people who are interested in this music, which I, I think is incredible. Um, but I always say like, I think, um, I, I, I'm not interested in the house music community becoming just as big as humanly possible for the sake of it. I think it's a combination of introduction and education. If we're not also educating people about the roots of this music and why it's so impactful and why it's so important, then then when the next big thing rolls around, when progressive yodel core becomes the next <laughs> genre <laughs> oh that people gosh. flock to, all these people who have participated in house music culture in a really surface level or peripheral way will flock to that. And I don't want that. I want house music to touch and impact other people in the same deep way it's impacted me. So that is why I'm so, you know, gung-ho about um, the importance of educating people about the the roots of this genre. And it's just, you know, a huge I passion think, of mine. I think that's what makes it special though for me. And I think I fell in love with house music in the same way. And I think the thing that a lot of other guests on our show have also talked about is the community that yeah. revolves around and how many people care about that history and the roots of it and yeah. the meaning behind it. And I think that's why so many people connect to house music. I think that's why people connect to other styles of music too, is like, you're really not just connecting to the sound, you're connecting to the whole culture and everything that comes from that music, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like though, I mean, it also kind of travels in waves, right? Because yeah. I feel like there will be, you know, it will get lost. The the core values and the root of all mm -hmm. that information will all kind of get lost. In I mean, look at dubstep success. or, you know, any, anything yeah. like that. Like, But also happened in like 2012 when like yeah. Swedish EDM. House Mafia and Avicii and all those guys were cruising, Alesso and all these guys. And they're like, we're house music. And it's like, well, you guys don't sound anything like real <laughs> yeah. house, like old school house music, I guess I shouldn't say. But um, but they're, that's what they kind of stem from. But then they were just making something that was more commercially accessible. But then you kind of hear them say that and you're like, that doesn't totally add up for me, but like, I get what you're yeah. saying. And I think it's just a, a product of them, you know, a byproduct of them kind of having commercial success, having to feed a larger audience and, you know, it's uh -huh. gonna, it's gonna happen eventually. I think, I think it's, a, it's a cycle. Gets, it it yeah. has to, cause yeah, it fell down after and then became rooted again. Yeah. Techno started having a huge rise and then like Mirage opened up in like 2016, uh -huh. 2017. You know, it yeah. kind of had got, got grounded again. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, back to the roots of the music. Was it Chuck Roberts? Uh, no one man owns house. Is that the take away? Take away my house. Um, classic house card. If I got that wrong, mm. I believe it was Chuck Roberts. But no one man owns house, right? Like, um, this music is for everybody. This music yeah. is. Um, you know, so fundamentally rooted in, you know, as we've talked about before, um, the queer community, the black community, the Latin community, the, you know, those were really the founders of this genre. So I think it's important that we continue to elevate that, ensure that um, that's not lost as the culture continues to progress. Yeah, 100%. You got your first release coming up. Yes. <laughs> Do you have anything else lined up at the moment? You're kind of uh, starting to plant these seeds now. So this has been a new exciting chapter for you. Yeah. Well, I'm starting to work with um, producers that I really love and respect, two of which are <laughs> sitting in front of me. <laughs> um, so super excited about the stuff that we're working on. Um, it's, it's interesting. I'm also trying to work with, I think, producers at um, all different levels. I'm partnering up with people who are also just starting their production journeys um, also right. and we're like <laughs> little deer baby deers trying to learn how to walk when we're sitting down in front of Ableton together that's part of the fun of it <laughs> yeah. too you know yeah. and then when I, when I sit down with one of you guys I'm just like just taking it all in um, 
But um, yeah, working on that, I'm super excited for this first release. Um, I think I'm always really drawn to really interesting and unique vocal samples. Um, this release I have coming up, Fundamental, is... Um, pretty pretty sassy pretty soulful it kind of harkens back to this um era in the 90s um where there was a lot of i'll call it like sassy classic house if you guys know uncanny oh, yeah. alliance like i got my education which they did this whole kind of almost um parody version of gypsy woman um but but yeah, I'm kind of that was kind of the influence or the era that I was thinking about as that track came together. But as I continue to progress, I really want to number one. I think right now, not pigeonhole myself into saying like this is the type of music I want to make. Right? If I sit down and I start a project and it sounds good and I'm vibing with it, and I'm like this is something that I myself would play at the club. I'm going to continue to explore that idea. I'm working on some organic house right now. I'm working on some deeper and harder stuff, which is not something that I thought I would kind of start with mm -hmm. uh, but then as i've told both of you i'm i'm really interested in like leaning into that soulful sound which i think is is difficult to capture in a really um relevant way but um i think the next step is working with some sangers like yes. some people who can sang yeah, um yeah. <laughs> who, well, i was gonna mention <laughs> that like you know kind of have knowing you for a while now yeah. and, and seeing you dj a bunch of times i think what's really cool is that like your song curation before getting into production really like shines through when you're kind of putting ideas together and your mm -hmm. ideas are really cool and they feel really genuine and sincere to like what you already kind of form your DJ sets to be like. So mm -hmm. I think you've done a great job just kind of really being able to represent yourself. And sure, one might be, you know, organic, one might be this or that, but like that's at the end of the, the day- the best part is exploring that, that yeah, as you and make a, it. And that's a key element to being a good producer is having the consistency of sounding like you. So when you hear it, you know, oh, that's that's Rob's sound, you know. Yeah, or thank you. Sorry, thank I, you. I, I, I said your real name. <laughs> I apologize. I appreciate that. And yeah, I think another one of the things that I really want to, so if there are any um, anybody who fits this bill out there listening, um, I'm a huge female rap fan. If you ever come to a oh, St. Yeah. Francis set, <laughs> you're going to hear me, you're going to hear me sample some Cardi and some Megan Thee Stallion and some Flo Millie and some Glorilla. I've yeah. always just been drawn to female rap, I think, because me as a person, um, I think I'm a type of per person who carries masculine and feminine energy in a pretty distinct way. And I think female rappers do that too. Um, sure. And that's, I think, why I'm always just drawn to that. So as a next step, and I think I was telling you this the other day, Ricky, I'm really starting to work with, I want to I wanna lean into that a little bit more. If there are any, any New York based or nationally based rappers that want to work together on some cool, funky house music, let's Go do it. Go down to the DMs real quick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hit them up. That's awesome. I think that's a great rap for you and the consistent shout outs to Megan the Stallion on your Instagram is yes. always, is always a, uh, <laughs> me when I listened back to my set and I was like oh I played four Megan the Stallion samples in the set. <laughs> nice hey you got to do what you like right yeah <laughs> if it feels right at the moment nice so any other like long-term plans and goals for you right now I mean what are you kind of working toward what's in the what's in the future what's in the scope for you I'm all moment? yeah I'm always looking towards the next thing and I think production was was the big step for me yeah. I had this idea in my head by this summer I wanted to have something out in my mind it was going to be like I was like I'll self-release something on SoundCloud and with the encouragement of you guys and a lot of other people I already have multiple remixes out some of which are like taking off and doing really well and I am floored and grateful that I already have my first official release so super pumped for that 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 goal arrived a lot sooner than I was expecting um and I'm also just realizing that like production is the route to get on the stages that I eventually want to be on. So if it means, um, I don't want to say deprioritizing, but really leaning into having a production presence, um, that's really my goal for 2025 so that I can launch myself into next year with a, with a really strong presence and be able to strongly make a case to some of these promoters clubs that I eventually want to be playing. Um, two very, there. yeah, two very tactical goals that I, I have for myself for next year um, is play a festival and play an international gig. So those are okay, those. That's nice. that's what I have my sights set on for Let's for go. 2025. And I know I need to have a lot of uh, a lot of music out by then. So that's yeah. what I'm burying burying my nose in right now. I think I, I one thing I kind of wanted to bring up. You know, 
since you kind of moved here and got into the scene, what advice would you give to somebody that's kind of doing the same to get into playing clubs and, and events that you're into? You know, how did you break into the market of DJing and getting on bills and stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. So my first, um, I mean, I, I think just generally forming genuine connections with people is like the best and the easiest way to get booked. Yeah. Uh, my first, um, gig came through a friend of a friend. It was, it's at a, a bar, uh, called pink metal in East Williamsburg. Um, so I was introduced to the owner and, um, I had a little residency there and now I've been proud to pass that residency on to one of, uh, to one of my friends and the mentees. Nice. Um, you outgrew it. Uh, a little bit. Did you outgrow the residency? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was. I mean, it's a fabulous club, and I'm glad that they were able to take it over. That's um, awesome. But, Congrats. Uh, but thank you. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just um, going out, and I will say, and I think this is something that pretty much everyone in the scene echoes: just genuinely and organically showing up for other people and being yeah, happy for back. their successes. Um, the, you know, the opera. That's when the opportunities come when you're not trying to do a quid pro quo type thing. But when you are genuinely happy and supporting for other people, people, people take note of that and people will yeah. remember that and come back to you. And I had, um, I played a, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything major, but I played a gig, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, from someone I met two years ago and he just reached back out to me. It was like, Hey man, we met <laughs> two years, two years ago. And he's nice. like, I need someone to slot in tonight at, you know, we had our, um, guy drop or had an emergency and drop out. Can you come through and, you know, play Rock tonight? And I'm like, great. Fantastic. So and he's like, drop that Megan, the stallion edit you've been playing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually, I actually dropped my, um, I dropped fundamental, my upcoming oh, nice. release and a voguing battle started. That's so what I, about. Would, yeah. <laughs> I would say that's a pretty good song. Signs. That is a great <laughs> sign. Um, but yeah, I would um, breaking into the scene just um, and also like I think same with production. People pigeonhole themselves too much into saying like this is the kind of DJ that I am. This is what I should be playing. When I started out, I was really branding myself as a disco DJ because I thought that was maybe easier for people or promoters or club owners to understand. And I've definitely, I think, migrated away from that a little bit more and towards house because that's what I feel really, really natural playing. But um, but yeah, I would say also don't pigeonhole yourself too much into like, this is my lane. This is what I'm in. Um, if you're really looking to get started out here in New York and, and you know, it's, it's a competitive market, but there are really amazing parts of this community where, um, I would say invest in that, become a, find those pockets of people that you really connect with. And, um, what's, what's the, uh, saying, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. Yeah. So, Oh, nice. Yeah. Strength in numbers. Yep. Uh, just a couple more things, I guess. I wanted to see. So you did an out of town gig not too long ago in another state. Am I wrong? I did. Yes, yeah. in Kentucky. How did that come about? Um, so my best friend, who I'm going to be working, um, Scott T. Smith. Um, I'm going to be working on some music with him. Um, he is an amazing folk singer and vocalist. He lives in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and yeah, he knows the owner of the club who I am now <laughs> by extension friends with. Um, it's a really amazing club in Louisville called Galaxy. They have a, I, I would, I, akin to like, I would like a superior ingredients, like a really nice indoor outdoor space. Nice. Um, so yeah, every time I just um, come to town, I, you know, see if I can hit the, you know, hit them up, see if I can play there. So I played there back in the fall, just kind of their smaller side room. They liked it. They wanted to have me back. So I did my first headlining gig there yeah, back nice. in March. I have a really funny, um, story of my travels there, but, um, I was flying to, I was flying to Louisville and it's like, you know, a small charter flight right before I get on the plane. I get like Delta hits me up and they're like, we've up, automatic up, upgrade to first class. And I was like, Let's yes, go. Sweet. Way to start. So, <laughs> automatic upgrade to first class. I'm in like a solo seat, whatever. And I get on the plane and they announce over the intercom. They're like, um, it, it's Jimmy's first day as a flight attendant. Everyone give it up for <laughs> this dude. So it was this dude's first day as a flight attendant, or first flight ever. So he comes over to me. He's like, do you want anything to drink? And I was like, yeah, I'll take a champagne, whatever. And then he's just making chit chat. And I'm like, oh, he's like, what are you going to Louisville for? And I was like, oh, I'm a DJ and I'm headlining um, a big club down there. And I think this guy thought I was like, Diplo or something <laughs> so, like like he thought I was like a huge all the champagne like yeah. huge DJ and I'm not kidding I my gig was not that night but like 
a new drink in my hand every 15 minutes. Nice. I was... <laughs> I was wavy by the time I got off nice. that flight, but it was such a, I was like, okay, I could get used to this. Yeah, I could get there used you go. to this lifestyle. That's what it is. You get that flight attendant hookup. Oh, yeah. Whoa. There you go. All the bubbles. Um, so why don't you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Yeah, you can find me on social media. All my handles are Saint Francis. That's S-A-I-N-T-E Francis. Um, you can find me on SoundCloud, on Instagram, soon to be on Spotify and Ooh. Apple Music and wherever music is streamed um, in, the, in the next week or so. And then um, slowly but surely growing my TikTok presence under the, under the same handle. So nice. that's where you can find me. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Great. Wow. Great. Such a great conversation. And continue. We're yeah. excited for your DJ set coming up. <laughs> yes. I've not prepared Make sure you guys anything. check that That's out. In often the, the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a thank you to Sound Collective for letting us film here. 28 Broadway. You guys can come here, use all this amazing gear for membership. We also have online classes that you guys can check out. Thank you, St. Francis, for being here. Make sure yes. you guys check out his DJ set. I'm Rich Furness. And I'm Lefty. Peace.